WPSU is your source for Penn State sports, Penn State research, Penn State community. But we can't do it without your support. Become a member today and get a DVD of your favorite Penn State show. Presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. From the studios of Penn State Public Broadcasting, this is To the Best of My Knowledge. Good evening, I'm Graham Spanier. Tonight we'll talk about the world of choral music. More than 42 million children and adults in the U.S. sing in choruses, performing in concert halls, churches, and town squares. Choral singing brings people together as differences in culture, race, and language disappear and they become one voice. Tonight we'll discuss the evolution of choral music, performance, and academic programs. We'll also take your phone calls at 1-800-543-8242. You can also email questions to response at psu.edu. And now let's meet our guests. Tony Leach is an associate professor of music and music education in Penn State's College of Arts and Architecture. He is the university's second laureate and founding musical director and conductor of the Penn State choir Essence of Joy. Gilbert Lewis Bailey II is a senior at Penn State, majoring in musical theater from Bensalem, Pennsylvania. He has appeared in many school of theater and resident theater productions and is a tenor in Essence of Joy. Thank you both for being on our program tonight. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having us. I, I know you both and you're two of the most talented folks around and uh, I think our viewers and listeners might be interested in hearing a little bit about your background, how you got started in this line of work. Tony? I use a quote often to describe that uh, relationship. Music chose me so I embrace it. Uh, I grew up in Washington DC and my mom was a pianist, my dad was a singing pastor and uh, so there was no opportunity not to sing um, and when I was eight years old I started piano lessons and there's been no turning back from that point so we sang as a family, um, I played uh, for Sunday school and eventually Sunday morning so the choir thing has always been a huge part of my background as far as my family is concerned in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, choirs. And now they pay me to do the choirs and I love it. Yeah, what could be better? Gilbert, how about you? What's your background? Uh, my background is, is actually very similar. Um, I started off four years old at Mount Sinai Baptist Church in the choir there. Uh, six years old, I had my first solo at church. Um, to an Andre Crouch song, Why Aren't You Following Me? And then after that, it was my grandmother made me do choir. My mom was always a choir director of the youth choir at church, and so I was always in youth choir. Um, my grandmother had a choir in Colorado called the Jubilation Singers, which was a community-based gospel choir, and we, we had a good time there. And then high school, I was in choir. Then I came to college, and they don't pay me to be in choir yet, but I <laughs> am in Essence of Joy, so I'm still in choir in college. But and yeah. you're also the choreographer I in am. Essence of Joy. I am, I am so. the choirographer in, in Essence <laughs> okay, of Joy. So, what, what's um, <laughs> what's the story behind a choir having a choreographer? Well, it uh, it it has to do with one individual a former student, uh, Allison Daniel, who graduated in 2008, again, musical theater major, but uh, came to us from Duke Ellington High School of the Performing Arts in D.C., came into Essence of Joy back in 2004, and she said, I think I can do something that will help us to be even better 
in our presentation of some of the music that we do. And so for four years, Alice, I would talk to Allison, let her know what I was planning to do, and she would say, we can do this, we can do that. And then over time, she would put choreography on the choir, and that has transformed a lot of what we do as far as contemporary gospel is concerned. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, Nathan followed Allison, and now Gilbert is the current choreographer. Yeah, and how's, how's he doing? He's doing a, 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 an A-plus job. <laughs> yes. He really is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he probably only said that because we're on camera right now. No, but that's great. no, no I, I, I know he has, and uh, I've, I've seen him dance and, and move, and uh, he, he is quite remarkable. Yes, he is. In fact, we have a clip that uh, we're going to show, something that we uh, grabbed from somewhere. It's, it's a very short one, but I think it shows Gilbert working with the group mm -hmm. on this uh, concept of uh, choreography. Let's, uh, let's run that clip right now. Very good. Right, left, right, boom, boom. Right, left, right, left, right. Huh, huh, step, ba, ba, ba. Uh, uh, step. Uh. Oh, that's great. Now, a lot of people would look at that and say, that's gospel music. Mm -hmm. But is it gospel music? And what is the difference between the choir music and gospel music? Okay. Uh, it's gospel music because this is contemporary gospel style. It is an idiom within the large realm of choral music. Choral music is just whatever is being sung by a group of people today, historically. Context will affect that, and then our preferences will mm -hmm. affect it. And then, of course, we have trends in choral music. And what the audience just saw was um, just a snippet of actually two pieces. And um, the one piece is getting ready to come into the repertoire of Essence of Joy. What happens, we learn the music first before we learn the movement. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, there's a disconnect that will emerge. So how do you describe Essence of Joy? Is it a choral group or is it a gospel music? Group? Essence of Joy is a choral group or choir that performs sacred and secular music from the African and African American choral traditions. Mm -hmm. So we are not a gospel choir, but we sing contemporary and traditional gospel music as well as a whole lot of other stuff from the standard choral canon, yes. Mm -hmm. Now you do a lot of different things, of course. You're acting, singing, dancing in, uh, in choral groups. What, what's your favorite thing to do? What's my favorite thing to do? Um, out of the ones we just mentioned, actually, my favorite thing to do would be to sing with the choir and uh, sing stuff from the African-American and African aesthetic that we're singing from. It's always been a lot of the things that we do sing, the stuff that is gospel, resonates personally with me from my background and the churches that I've gone to. And so that's always a lot of fun to get that one Sunday at evening rehearsal to go back to kind of, you know, my roots as far as musically where I sit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, a recent study uh, uh, by Chorus America found that singing in a choir is strongly correlated with qualities that are associated with success in life, mm. such as civic involvement, discipline, and teamwork. Mm. Could you just talk about the benefits you see in people singing in a choir? There are, there are many, but the, the, the things that immediately come to mind, first of all, if you're going to be in a choir, it is kind of assumed that you are willing to share your vocal ability. And some have more, some have less. That's okay. Um, it also means that you're going to show up for rehearsal. And if people show up for rehearsal, then they'll probably show up for work. 
They'll probably also show up for a concert. It also means that there's going to be a period of preparation as far as rehearsals go, as choirs get ready for a public event. Church, of course, it's Sunday morning or Saturday morning, Friday night, depending on denomination. A community choir, they may only perform once a year or once a quarter, just depends. Um, our college choirs, uh, we perform usually once a semester as far as our campus involvement is concerned. So a person that's, that's making a commitment to being in a choir usually understands that it's going to require time. My thing is, I'm not going to waste your time, so don't you dare <laughs> take my time by not being here. <laughs> <laughs> if you've just joined us, I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State, and this is to the best of my knowledge on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting, and the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Our topic tonight is choral music with guest Tony Leach, associate professor of music and music education in Penn State's College of Arts and Architecture, mm -hmm. and Gilbert Bailey, a Penn State student majoring in musical theater. You can join the conversation. Give us a call at 1-800-543-8242 or email us at response at psu.edu. Now, Tony, 70% of people who sing in choirs in America, according to data I've seen, got their start doing it in elementary mm -hmm. or middle school. Yes. So I'd like to talk with both of you for a moment about what's happening in the schools today. Uh, we hear that some schools are cutting back on music teachers and they can't uh, afford or uh, are, are unable to, to keep some of their groups going. Mm -hmm. How important is it to get, get started that early? And uh, most of the people in your uh, group, Essence of Joy, did, did they start like Gilbert at a pretty young age? Yes. Uh, research says as far as music aptitude is concerned that what isn't kind of in place by the time a kid turns nine years old probably won't be there. So the earlier kids are exposed to singing, to instrumental music, to listening to music, to seeing people respond to music, there is a, a, a predisposition that's in place. So in elementary schools or in graded choral programs in churches or in community choirs where there are graded programs, it's wonderful to have a system that a kid and a family can buy into, again, because it's an investment of time. The, the, the difference between that kid in choral music and the kid in instrumental music, of course, is that the instrumentalists are investing in an instrument. The kid in choral music is not buying an instrument because our body is our instrument. By the time they get to middle school, they're starting to have to make a few choices about how they want to spend mm -hmm. their time. So that by the time they get to high school, hopefully there's been, from the groundswell, a group of kids that comes up through the ranks understanding what's happening, what's in, involved, what's required to not only have fun, as far as choirs are concerned, but also to explore uh, the rich uh, array of, of choral idioms, whether it be from musical theater or from opera or folk music or, or what have you. And in those school districts that get that, you see a vibrant program, and, and we are blessed in, in State College to have, be surrounded with a school district, a local school district, where music is alive mm -hmm. and well, and we are grateful for that because a lot of those kids show up here at the university and populate our choirs, our orchestras, and our bands. Well, how important was this to you when you were growing up? Oh, it was very important to me. I actually went to a school that our music program didn't get the the notoriety that we would have liked it to. So, you know, some years the funding would be there and some years it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was it was really a great time for you as a musician when the funding was there and you could go to the competitions and see other choirs and you could see professional choirs that might come through town at the Kimmel Center or anything. But then there were years, um, particularly my sophomore year, where we just, we couldn't get any money to do anything and, and it, it's it's disheartening when you love to sing and when you love to do choral stuff so much and uh, yes I, I would say that that bringing that back to schools it would be great for for younger kids to 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 get that experience of working as a group to sing you know because nobody necessarily thinks that that there's a lot in it but there really is there's a lot to be gained from it did, did you see a difference when you were growing up between the kinds of kids who were involved the 
in this way, and those who weren't. Oh yes. Were what, what are what are the, some of the things you see in a in That's a school funny. with the kids who don't get connected with something like yeah, this? My mom used to love when I hung out with my choir friends, <laughs> and 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 she she would always love them because they it, it was just a they were more gracious um, mm -hmm. when they came to your house. They they understood understood teamwork you know whenever they left my house nothing was ever left dirty and and it, you know kind of we would clean up and help each other out and and that's like a little example but my mom used to love my choir friends just because we would we, we had a sense of community and a sense of responsibility amongst us that nobody would ever let anybody falter if, if we saw somebody going down the wrong the wrong path mm -hmm. whatever that may be there was always somebody there to reach out and say hey man come back we have rehearsal or was it just that you were engaged with some activity and yeah. therefore staying out of trouble or was, was there something about the choir itself I think I think it, it's two. I think it's both of those. You know, mm -hmm. I happened to be in in school in in high school, particularly with a, a great group of kids at the time in in um, my choir, and we we all took care of each other. But it was also being in tandem, being as a group of people who cared about one another and had a goal that we wanted to reach together. I would seem to be similar with a big basketball team or a football team. Mm -hmm. We were just all focused on the same goal, and we wanted to make each other better. And through making each other better, we made ourselves better, and the ensemble was better. Mm -hmm. So we always looked out for each other in that way. That's great. Yeah. We're going to open up the phone lines now. Mm -hmm. We have our uh, first caller in the queue. It's Bill from Harrison City. Bill, thanks for calling in. You're on the air. Thank you, Dr. Spanier. Um, I would like to make a, a few comments to uh, Dr. Leach and also to um, Gilbert. Uh, my wife and I have seen Essence of Joy two or three times. And I am saying this as a compliment. Every time I have, we have listened to them, they have brought tears to my eyes. That group is so, so good. <laughs> I want to specifically uh, say to Gilbert that we have seen him a number of times on stage. Uh, he was in The Wiz last year. We've seen him in Romeo and Juliet, and he is an exceptional talent. And I uh, want to wish him all the luck in the world in his future endeavors. And... Uh, to Dr. Leach, I want to say that I love the way he directs his choir. I just love the way he stands up there when he's not playing the piano, of course. <laughs> and uh, just his movements. I think he's a very great asset to the university. And there is just so much talent in the choral department and the musical theater department. And we got the pleasure to meet Gilbert a few times, and we um, think he's a great, great young man, and uh, I just think everything that the music department does up there is, is terrific. Well, that's very nice of you to, to call Bill and to uh, give those, those compliments. Uh, I, I think Gilbert is going to be a, a big star. That's my opinion. I told him that once, but figured I better not tell him too many times. Uh, and Tony, of course, is already a star. I, I'm just curious. You're from Harrison City. How far is that from State College? Well, Dr. Spanier, we it's it's in Westmoreland County, but my wife and I have a uh, condo up at the uh, uh, up there at Penn State, and uh, we spend probably. 60% of our time up there, uh -huh. and, um, you know, we do some volunteer work uh, for the undergraduate admissions department. We do spend the summer day, and uh, That's hopefully, great. One of, hopefully one of these days we'll be able to move up there full time. We're both retired. It's just a matter of, you know, the economy and, and being able to sell our house, but uh, my son went to Penn State, and my wife and I, neither one of us went to Penn State, but our blood is blue and white. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, you know, you're a great example of someone who, who tries to spend as much time as they can in, uh, around the university, I think in part from the, the sounds of what he was saying, mm -hmm. because he likes attending uh, theatrical performances and uh, uh, Essence of Joy mm -hmm. concerts, and, and uh, that, that's just a... A great call for for us to get. He mentioned uh, Tony about you uh, uh, playing the piano yes. uh, and sometimes standing up. Yes. I've seen you do both at the same time. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, <laughs> where you play the piano while you're standing up. How yes. does that work? It's that's the athletic part of being <laughs> a musician, and uh, uh, you know there are there are, part of our repertoire is a cappella, 
So I'm a stand-up conductor always uh -huh. at that point, or unless I'm using my assistant conductor, depends. Uh, sometimes, uh, especially as we move around and we're in various situations, the piano may not necessarily be placed as I like to have it in the center of the choir. So if I'm somewhere else, then we do what we need to do to accommodate that. But uh, from a conducting standpoint, whatever the choir needs at that moment, and if I need to give it, that's what they're going to see from me. And uh, I'll share just a short story from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. We were doing a concert in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania several years ago at uh, Camp Hill Presbyterian, actually. And um, a person shared with me after the concert, she was seated way in the back of the church, and she, saw, she thought, I need to see what the kids are seeing. Mm -hmm. So she moved during the intermission and came to wherever it was that she could see my face. And she realized that there was a whole lot yeah. of information going on <laughs> in my face as well as in my physical gesture. So I thought, okay, they're watching me. It's okay because it's about me moving this whole process forward. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's, that, that's interesting. Now I've been situated on some occasions where I can see the students and you both. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the students, it, it, it looks like they're all looking at him. Oh, yeah. It's and, and But do you really need him? I mean, you, you've been to all the rehearsals, <laughs> and he's up there, and he's singing and making these gestures, and everybody's looking like they're paying attention. So, but yes. how important is that? You need Dr. Leach. Dr. Leach. Dr. Leach actually has an amazing talent for reading an audience without ever looking at them. Uh -huh. Or, or you, like, he stands up, and it, it kind of, like, he stands up and you feel comfortable. You know he has a handle on the situation and you know since Dr. Leach has it, no matter what comes out tonight, Dr. Leach is ready. And so as long as you stay with Dr. Leach, we're, we're ready to go. He, he, he has an amazing talent for conducting you without hands, without big sindle, signals and big gestures. That's why he can sit at the piano for half a concert because you know exactly where he's going and exactly what he wants you to do mm -hmm. every single time. <laughs> and the time that you mess up, you yeah. know it's because you, were, you weren't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> and right. everybody else in the choir knows it too. <laughs> All right, let's take another call. It's Wallace from Brookville. Good evening, Wallace. Thanks for joining us in the program. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed watching this. I didn't realize that we're so much involved in, in the choir activities, but I would also like to point out the importance of uh, education, musical education in grade schools, and study after study showed how much it has increased the student's ability to learn. And uh, I, I think that's something that we as parents really need to push our school boards to do, is mm -hmm. to make this connection early on in the student's life. And I just want to thank you very much for your wonderful well, let, program. Let me, let me ask you, uh, uh, Wallace, now, uh, are you involved in this line of work, or are you just a parent of kids who feels this is important? Uh, I'm a parent of two grown daughters uh -huh. who uh, had the uh, advantage of having a good musical yeah. education. Yeah. And they turned out both uh, to excel in academics and plus with the musical uh, life afterwards. My daughter plays the violin, and she's been playing that since she was five. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, but the, the school is a very important role in, in the education, and I think music plays a really important role in that. Well, I think it's great that uh, that you appreciate that and that you called in to, to mention that. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for your program. You know, uh, I get to know uh, a lot of students in theater and music, and uh, uh, they have such incredible talent. Mm. Uh, many of them, you know, aren't real great in math, for example. They're just not interested in math. I don't know if you are. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. They, they, but their talents show up in other in areas. Other, that's right. But so they... But then of, there are some that are truly... Some are. Yeah, we have some, a couple math Some are, but, but the time. reason I yeah. mention it is, is that some students in the fine and performing arts mm -hmm. don't consider themselves brilliant. Mm. They consider themselves talented. Mm. But I think about the brilliance that's required mm for example, for a concert pianist mm -hmm. to memorize oh, yeah. thousands of notes, yes. not just the note, but the pacing and the pedals and the how long to sustain the key and to get it in the right order with the right emotion and, and, and sensitivity. And, and for a student who's performing in a, 
in a play that mm -hmm. lasts for two or three hours mm -hmm. to remember every word yes. and uh, and for a, a musical theater students who might be doing an hour's worth of music to remember all of the words and the choreography yeah. and everything that goes with it yeah. to me that is brilliance yeah. and uh, but but would you agree that a, a lot of your fellow students probably think, oh, I'm, I'm really not that smart. I just happen to have this talent. Yeah, that's but that's that's a common common refrain in in our hallways that you know we're not we're not the book smartiest people, but we do we are talented, and I think everybody knows it. Actually, we, but we do have I think. In my class, particularly, everybody has a particular book smart mm -hmm. that they specialize in. It's like if you know you need to ask anything about math, ask Kelsey; she probably knows. Or if you need to ask something about sociology, ask Gilbert; he might know. You know. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, we do consider our on-stage talents, our our mus musicianship, to be our stronger suits for mm -hmm. us. But somewhere deep in the recesses of the brain, there must be a connection. I mean, you you can't do all the kind of stuff that you're students do mm -hmm. and not really have a, a great aptitude for some important things. Well, that's um, part of why I shared with the Penn State Forum audience on Friday, last Friday, that Penn State made room for my gift in what I do in music and music education, but at the same time, um, it's the, 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 what I do is one thing, what I'm able to help others to discover and do within this context is the real joy because they, whether they be a singer, whether they be a pianist or a, an emerging teacher, uh, once they recognize what they have from the inside out and then allow us as faculty to kind of frame that, whether it be in musical theater or in performance or composition or what have you, mm -hmm. then we have this wonderful artistic community within the context of this fabulous research university. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what makes the Happy Valley, for me, such a, a vital and vibrant encounter because no one's saying, no. They're saying, can you? And we, we usually will say, well, yeah, we can do that, whatever that is. <laughs> We've been talking about Essence of Joy, and I'm sure some of the people watching have, have seen Essence of Joy, but others haven't. Mm. So I thought we would show a little clip of Essence of Joy in action okay. just to expose people a, a little more to what we're really talking about. Let's, let's run that now. There were no mirrors in my nana's house, no mirrors in my nana's house. And the beauty that I saw in everything, the beauty in everything was in her eyes. Was in her eyes. There were no mirrors in my nana's house, no mirrors in my nana's house. There were no mirrors in my nana's so I never knew that my nose was too relaxed, and I never knew that my skin was too relaxed, and I never knew that my clothes didn't fit, and I never knew there were things that I missed, and the beauty in everything was in her eyes. Very good. Mm. So. Let's talk about this for a moment in the context of music today, today generally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a type of music that people enjoy in certain settings, but it's not mostly what people listen to. It's not what they go to concerts for. Uh, it's not what's on American Idol mm -hmm. or <laughs> out there in, in the popular area. Now, you're 21, 22 yes. years old. Um, you kind of grew up with all of this modern music there, mm -hmm. but uh, what, what, what's going on today out there? Mm -hmm. is, is, is this going to die away at, at, at some point, or how do we get kids to pay attention to mm -hmm. a broader yeah. array of music? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I, think, I think getting kids to pay attention to a broader realm of music means that there has to be on both ends, there has to be a, a little bit of of help. You know, on the one end, the 
traditional music forms have to say, okay, we accept what you're doing as, as art because to contemporaries, it very much is an art that they do. And then the contemporary music forms have to look back and say, yes, but we're drawing influence from here and we're drawing influence from there. And so we have to pay homage back to where we're getting um, our, our, new mu our new music from. And so as long as everybody respects one another and everybody joins in dialogue together, then New, then newer generations like myself will be more apt to listening to a Mozart and, and, and going back to, to some of the traditional forms of music. But a lot of times you'll get in a situation where your traditionalists don't really respect what your contemporary mm -hmm. musicians are doing mm -hmm. as, as music or, or, or as true art. And so that becomes the conversation and the discourse. And so I think as long as everybody's respecting one another, then, oh, sure, I, people will stay in tune to what, what, what happened and what was in the past. But there always has to be respect given to what's going on and, and what's being done, you mm -hmm. know, by the new guys. And how do you see it, Tom? Uh, something that I, I responded to in email today, one of my colleagues uh, who's teaching high school uh, in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, asked a similar question, and I said, you know, I decided a long time ago that I'm not going to chase trends in choral music, and as far as Essence of Joy is concerned, I'm not going to chase the trends in African American music in particular, but I have to be conversational, mm -hmm. knowledgeable, uh, and ready to embrace current trends within the mix, the broad mix of things, because as I said earlier in the show, we do sacred and secular music from the African and African American choral idioms. So from this standpoint of the facilitator of an experience, I need to be not only conversational, but I need to be able to motivate and do and demonstrate all the high caliber musicianship mm -hmm. that I do when I'm preparing a choir to do a Bach motet mm -hmm. as I'm preparing the choir to do uh, something by Donald Lawrence mm -hmm. or another contemporary African American uh -huh. artist. So my, my role then as a teacher is to be a model, be an example, but at the same time, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this because everyone in our audience is not the same. They don't bring the same thing to that concert, and they're going to take lots of things from that array of choral repertoire that we will present every time we go, whether we're on campus or we're off campus. If you're just joining us, I'm Graham Spanier, president of Penn State, and this is to the best of my knowledge on WPSU, Penn State Public Broadcasting, and the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Our topic tonight is choral music with guest Tony Leach, associate professor of music and music education in Penn State's College of Arts and Architecture, and Gilbert Bailey, a Penn State student majoring in musical theater. You can join the conversation. Give us a call at 1-800-543-8242 or email us at response at psu.edu. I want to turn this a little bit in a technical direction mm -hmm. for a moment. You know, every once in a while the Vienna Boys Choir comes through here mm -hmm. and uh, I guess they can only be a certain age because mm -hmm. something happens to their voices. That's true. And yes. They <laughs> want certain voices. And, and you're working a lot with college students, mm -hmm. but I know you also have a group that's of, of older folks mm -hmm. like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like us. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just wondering what the, uh, what, what the science or the art of that is when you're working with voices of different ages. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of music you pick, but also how you train them or what you can do to help people to kind of keep their voices uh, going in the right direction at different stages? Five or six little things. I said today in my university choir rehearsal, never louder than beautiful. And something clicks in, especially to that particular group of singers that I was sharing that. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, a, a different sonority came from them, which was more appropriate for what we were doing. So on one hand, uh, my role is to guide singers to making really good decisions about what they're going to do vocally. One of the other goals in rehearsal is to allow singers to build stamina. We come to rehearsal, we learn the music, we listen to music, we go away. 
and that happens over a period of time. And uh, music that is more complex, of course, requires more rehearsing. Well, in working with an adult choir, we, we learn at some point we need to balance off the complexity with things that are easier to sing and or things that might have great audience appeal. So that conductor is always thinking ahead. Can the choir sustain this Verdi Requiem? It, with Essence of Joy, where the choreographed pieces show up in the second half of the concert, if we do them bang, 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 one after another, there's going to be a level of fatigue mm -hmm. that comes into play. And so my role then is to, to space things out so that they're always vocally ready for what's coming. And, and if I have a soloist for something, then I need to also be aware of what they are doing because when time for them to step into in front of that choir, they need to be vocally fresh. Opera singers uh, learn this early on in their career. They're singing three, four, five hours as far as some roles are concerned. So it's all, it's all the same thing when you really look at it from a technical standpoint, mm -hmm. but the music director, the conductor has to be savvy in how they're planning that rehearsal, how they're planning that performance experience so that the choir's always in its best light mm -hmm. as far as performance is concerned. One of the things uh, I happen to be reading today, actually, an interview with one of our undergraduate musical theater students. Mm. It was in a, from a paper in another part of the country because he's on a leave of absence. Mm. He's on the national tour of a, of a show. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things he said in the interview was that he had to learn he really needed to stay in shape mm. because... Uh, you know, he's performing every night, yes. and he was finding early on that he was out of breath mm -hmm. because he was dancing and singing and, and so on. And, you know, I've seen you on the stage many times, Gilbert. You do acrobatics, you're tap dancing, you're, you're doing choreographed numbers, and, and then you're singing mm -hmm. yeah. right through it. How do you learn that? It, it's got to be about staying in shape, but when it comes to the breathing and so on, what, what's involved with that? There's a lot of preparation before anybody gets on stage. You know, you, you mark, you go through a song and you look for where am I going to take the breaths that I'm going to need, mm -hmm. and you, you learn what vowel will open you up to use the, the instrument as it's supposed to be used, mm -hmm. and then, I mean, then you should be able to sing on your head. As long as you're using the instrument correctly, you can mm -hmm. pretty much use it in, in any way, you know? So if I throw a backflip and sing a word at the same time, it's because I'm using my instrument correctly and it's, it's placed well. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just like, you know, if you, if you don't have the right fingers on the vowels to play the trumpet, mm -hmm. then you won't hit the notes correctly, you know, y even if you have it here. When you, you say your instrument, mm -hmm. you're referring to your voice or something I'm referring to the whole body mm -hmm. is Thank your you. vocal instrument I yes. have to make sure the whole body is your yeah. vocal instrument we um, um, a lot of my voice teachers the the first thing they want you to do is breathe deep breathe through your feet like mm -hmm. you, you use your whole body to sing um, if you're doing it correctly and then it's easy it's not just your throat and it's not just your mouth it's it's your whole body it's a it's a it's a full body experience now in a choir mm -hmm. Do you expect everyone to take their breaths at the same time, or can they all work it out on their own as long as they sing it? Properly? It's a combination of the of that. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes there are, and that's again one of the goals in rehearsal. We have to breathe here. I said in Sunday night, the sopranos are doing this, and so you have to be aware of what the sopranos are doing in order for the ensemble to be precise. And then in other cases. The choir is is uh, breathing very much as as a bunch of individuals, but the core of the choral sound is still moving forward. So it depends. There are the things that that contribute to that are tempo, style, language. If it's a piece with movement, then that uh, requires a whole nother awareness, a level of awareness. And so they're always thinking about what they're doing physically mm -hmm. to sustain that sound. Always. Now, there are people who compose music and then people who arrange it mm -hmm. and people who conduct it. Uh, when you're deciding to perform a piece, how do, do you feel any obligation to the person who wrote the song in the first place or somebody who made it popular? Or, or do you just say, no, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it? How, how do you make decisions like that? Uh, one of the goals in our conducting program is to learn early on that our job as conductors or music educators, whatever you want to call us, uh, is to 
to the best of our knowledge, uh, recreate what the composer or arranger intended. So we look at the score as a road map, and depending on our level of ability to analyze that score, to hear that score, uh, then our rehearsal strategies emerge from that process. Now, for me, we take it another step further, and, and uh, many of my colleagues do the same thing. I'm rarely going to have the choir do music that does not affect me, mm. or that I'm not committed to in some kind of a meaningful way. And then, over time, you realize that, okay, if we're going to do a program of one extended work, uh, a requiem, a mass, or something like that, then that will speak for itself, as we did in December, uh, an extended piece for Kwanzaa. But in other words, um, you're always looking for, how can I group things? What's the variety of tempos, key relationships, things that use instruments, things that use movement? And uh, bottom line is, what's the story? And uh, can we successfully convey that story? We don't have to believe the story, but we have to be, have integrity and a sense of honesty as we communicate that essence of the story through the lyric mm -hmm. and through the song, the song lyric with an audience. Now, when someone like Gilbert is in a Broadway type production mm -hmm. and he's out there on stage and it's him, He's the guy singing this, this song right now. Yeah. He's acting and dancing and, and so on. Mm -hmm. You, someone directing that would want you to shine and your personality to come out mm -hmm. and really wow them. But what about when he's performing in your choir yeah. and there are 40 people up yes. there? Yes. Do you want him acting that special and that good and while the other folks aren't quite in that zone? I mean, how, how do you manage that? Because you must have... Some people who have great voices, but they're not. Yes, they're they're, they're not from a personality standpoint mm -hmm. that that outgoing. Mm -hmm. And then you have other people who just want to steal the show, maybe. Well, if the choir is on, then every individual in that choir has reached somewhere in their experience in their musicianship, in their creativity, in their relationship with the people with whom they're standing, and are able to really project their essence. And that's one of the trademarks of this choir. No matter what edition of Essence of Joy you've seen or will see while I'm providing music direction, the kids reach out visually to that audience. And audience after audience has shared with me over the last 18 years how connected they feel with the kids because the kids are looking at them. Now they're looking at me, mm -hmm. but they're looking at that audience and drawing them in to this whole musical piece, whatever it is. And it's, it's, it's um, pretty awesome, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Russell from State College, thanks for calling in. You're on the air. Hello, uh, Dr. Spanier and Dr. Leach. I wanted to uh, ask you a question, Dr. Leach. Uh, what would you say is your favorite of the classic um, classical choral works? I'm a big fan of Handel and Beethoven. I was wondering what uh, your thoughts are. Several, and but I'll make it a kind of a top three or four list. Um, Box. Cantata, Krislag, and Totus Bonden, Verdi Requiem, Palestrina, Mass, Misa Pape Marcelli, and Beethoven, uh, Ninth Symphony. And we should point out you do other choirs as well as the Essence of Joy with yes. the gospel type music in the African and African American tradition. Yes. So, um, you know your stuff, it yes, sounds like. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think we, we mentioned it early on, but let me say again how delighted we are to have you as the Penn State Laureate uh, this year. And part of what you're doing is going out and spreading the message about a lot of the things that, that we're talking about, as well as putting on performances. Uh, we have a, an email that uh, I want to toss out to you, Tony. It it's, uh, says, what differences in expectations do you have for a church choir and a church audience mm -hmm. as opposed to a college audience uh, or an audience at a secular venue? Uh, 
Ah, so the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same expectation. Mm -hmm. um, I, because I am a, a, a director of music at a church in Washington, D.C., um, I'm uh, steeped in what has to happen on Sunday morning, but at the same time, what I do with Essence of Joy or what I do with University Choir or a festival choir that I'm conducting, um, the audience response is uh, keen to what it is that we're trying to convey through the music. Now, audiences are really funny from that standpoint also because audiences always respond wonderfully well to what they already know. So if they know the style, they know the artist, they know the song, they know the hymn, whatever the deal is as far as they're familiar, yay, victory. But if it's something new, then the, the deal is how am I presenting it and how are they receiving it? With Essence of Joy, I'm gauging that reaction through the reaction of my singers because my back is always to the audience unless I'm turning to the audience and inviting them to sing with us. We've recently uh, celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday and uh, uh, had that holiday as well as a, a number of educational uh, events around campus and uh, you, you were there a couple of times performing. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. recognized the value of music in his work. Yes. And could you just talk a little bit ab about that? I know the students uh, talked about it in, in the midst of their singing as well. Yes. Uh, I think the most, the best reference to that awareness is the end of the speech, the March on Washington, 1963, when he quoted from the spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last we're free at last, whatever. That's the refrain from a traditional African-American spiritual. Sometimes we forget that the man was pastor in a black Baptist church, and his dad was, and his grandfather was, and so, and his mother was the organist, the musician at Ebenezer Baptist Church until she was killed uh, after he was killed. Um, so music was a huge part of who he was, not only as an orator, and as a, an architect of great uh, uh, movements as far as nonviolent protests, but how it would uh, harness the energy and the focus of people in worship and as they left worship and went out to the lunch counter or to whatever, wherever they were going to uh, uh, be involved in some kind of a civil rights. And, and as, as a student in uh, Essence of Joy, uh, and, and having that connection with Martin Luther King Jr. being asked to sing and perform at events where his, where he's being honored or his birthday is is being remembered, what what does that mean to you? How does how does it feel seeing that connection? Well, it's an amazing honor, number one, uh, because my personal experience is, is steeped and rooted in in that experience of civil rights and and my family's experiences is is in it. And so to be associated as a choir on campus that's kind of the go-to for those, those types of programs and things is, is great. And it's also, it's also amazing to see how much um, is going on this week mm -hmm. in dedication to, to Dr. King. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's amazing. I actually participated in a, a march today um, on campus from Old Main up to the Pascarilla Center. And it's just amazing to see how how much people on campus are interested in social justice mm -hmm. and social equality and to be to be one of the choirs that that are kind of synonymous with that in this holiday is is an honor mm -hmm. we should point out and I, I think people could see it from that short clip that essence of joy is a very integrated oh, yes. group mm -hmm. you have blacks and whites and peoples of uh, people of other uh, racial and ethnic descent mm -hmm. and uh, it, it sends a great message I think yeah we are living the dream yeah in a very profound way. Yeah. Let's take a call from Al, who's calling from, calling from Newville. Hi, Al. Good evening, Dr. Spanier. I want to talk to all three of you. I'll start with you. Mm -hmm. I was at Hilton Sunday a week ago and met you. You were taking care of the door and then doing your magic tricks. <laughs> and it's great to see a president who is a person that can do those things. Well, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Then that means you saw Gilbert, too. Yes. Gilbert, where are you? I'm right here. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
This is the third time that I have seen Essence of Joy. Mm. It was the best. Awesome. I saw them in Hershey a few years ago, mm. down at York, Penn State, York. And uh, on Sunday, what was your specialty at, at the Hilton? At the, at the uh, which city were... Oh, uh, you, Harrisburg Hilton. Oh, Harrisburg. well, at that one, Gilbert was there as a part of his uh, being a senior in the musical That's theater right, program, yes. where That's they were right, doing man. the... The Broadway yes, review. Yes, I think we did uh, the we did uh, Moses supposes from uh, um, singing in the rain at that one. Right. Okay. So you would you would have seen him tap dancing and mm -hmm. singing in okay. in that show. The other thing that happened that day, the the, the song about seasons or the five hundred twenty five thousand. Yes. 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 Then I left a little bit early, went three blocks up the street to the Harrisburg Symphony. Mm -hmm. They had Broadway singers who did it, <laughs> <laughs> so I got nice. it twice. Maybe not even as well. <laughs> no, not nearly right. as well. <laughs> Great. And Dr. Leach. Yes. Dr. Lee, do you remember some old guy at the Second Presbyterian Church of Carlisle who had the congregation go, we are Penn State? Yes, I sure do. <laughs> that, that's me. Ah, I got you. Very good. Thank right. you for bringing that back to me. Yes. Okay, Al and that was Cheryl Parsons was there. Yes. If you recall. So yes. that was a great day. Yes, it was. And to all of you, thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you. you very much for your call, Al. And let's turn now to Alan, who's calling from Sugar Notch. Alan, where is Sugar Notch? Yeah. Oh, it's by Wilkes Bear. Okay. Well, glad to have uh, you calling into the program tonight. Yeah. Well, first I want to say I really like that idea. Never louder than beautiful. Mm -hmm. I really think that's an interesting way to way to think about it. Thank you. Uh, my question is, if you could have your choir sing a pop popular song of today, what would it be? Well, you, you need to further qualify what you mean by popular song of today because there's so many um, idioms that, are, that comprise popular music. So Maybe something in that, you know, the to so-called top 40 <laughs> list that, uh, where people are buying the music for iTunes or listening on the radio. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I tell you what, if it's... If it's uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> it's a broad question. A very broad. Yeah, a lot, lot of possibilities there. Uh, Gilbert, you compose music as well, I do. among your other talents. Where do you get your inspiration for, for that? Uh, well, uh, inspiration, inspiration is, is funny because it comes from anything, you know. I'll probably write something about this conversation we're having right now, <laughs> later on. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm actually very interested and involved in music technology um, nowadays, and uh, I, I like, you know, sitting down with, with Logic or Sibelius and, and just getting with my ideas out on paper, but I do, do draw a lot of inspiration from where I've been and what I've done and and that type of thing mm -hmm. the uh, there's another email here that says in this age of high stakes testing we often see curricular emphasis on those subjects which are tested mm -hmm. as the expense of the fine arts mm -hmm. in schools mm -hmm. and the question is you know what can institutions of higher education do to help focus more attention on on the fine arts uh, maybe I'll, I'll combine that with a question about your role as a Penn State laureate and what you're out there doing uh, in that capacity one of the things that I have been saying for a long time to audiences, especially as I serve as a festival conductor, I, I at some point will turn to the audience and say, the kids on this stage are our are, are present and our future. And uh, they didn't get on this stage because of who they are, but they got on this stage because a teacher mm. did something to enable them to be prepared to participate in this festival. This festival choir will never exist after tonight. They're all going to go back to their various home schools and school districts. And in some cases, if we're doing, if I'm doing a choir that um, is uh, drawing kids from a regional area, say several states, it's even more poignant. And my point is to the parents, uh, this would not happen if there were not music in your school community. Mm -hmm. Therefore, whatever you need to do as a voter, as a taxpayer, as a member of this organization, this, this Rotary Club or whatever, please let people know that you support 
the arts, whether it be music, dance, theater, visual arts, sculpture, what have you. You support this, and it's significant in the lives of these people on stage. And of course, when, when parents say those kinds of things, people that are in the position to make the decisions pay attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when cuts are made, whether it's a budget cut or staffing cut, sometimes um, it can be avoided or sometimes it can be less brutal. Gilbert, in our, our last minute or so, you know, people turn on a show like American Idol and they think people are either born with beautiful voices and they're great or they're terrible. Uh, but I have seen our people who teach voice do remarkable things with people who are already great singers. Yeah. Uh, could you just talk about the role of learning from people who teach voice and and what they do to help you much be much better? Oh yeah. Well, I, before I came to college, I had never had a voice lesson. I had never studied voice on any kind of professional level. So coming here, I got to work with professors like Mary Saunders and Bev Patton and Raymond Sage, who are the voice faculty of the music theater program. And they just open your voice up in so many new ways, um, new artists, new people you have never listened to before, and just new techniques for singing and using your instrument correctly. So it's just a good investment if you can do it. Get a voice lesson with somebody who knows. <laughs> mm. it's, it's wonderful. <laughs> well, that's a good note, Tanda. And I, I want to thank you both for being here very much. Uh, a fascinating discussion. Uh, thanks to our guest, Tony Leach, Associate Professor of Music and Music Education in Penn State's College of Arts and Architecture, and Gilbert Bailey, a Penn State student majoring in musical theater. And thank you for watching. Tonight's program will be stored in an electronic archive that can be accessed through WPSU.org. This site also links to online resources on tonight's topic. We hope you'll join us on Tuesday, February 16th, when our topic will be modern childbirth. To the best of my knowledge is a production of Penn State Public Broadcasting. For all of us here at WPSU, I'm Graham Spanier. Have a good night. Presentation of To the Best of My Knowledge on WPSU is made possible in part by support from the Penn State Alumni Association, informing, involving, and inspiring Penn State alumni and students through its publications, programs, and events. On the web at alumni.psu.edu. And from the members of WPSU. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.